Have you ever eaten a meal and experienced symptoms straight away? If you have, then you are not alone. Today, we are talking about the timing of symptoms and helping you figure out if it's FODMAPs or something else going on. My name is Alana Scott. I'm the founder of A Little Bit Yummy, and I'm your host today. And joining me is Lyndall Collins, research dietitian from the Monash FODMAP team. Hello, Lyndall. Hi, Alana. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me today. Oh, thank you so much for coming on and sharing your knowledge with us today. Now, this topic's quite controversial. It causes a lot of arguments in our online Facebook support groups, and it's something we see in our email FAQs all the time. So I thought we'd start sort of at the top like, and get you to explain exactly how FODMAPs trigger symptoms. Yes, great, great concept to explore to begin with, I think, because it's really key to understanding what's going on um, in our bodies when we eat FODMAP-containing foods. So there's really two ways, or mostly two ways, that FODMAPs will trigger symptoms. So FODMAPs are very small sugars, um, and they're what we call osmotically active. So this means that they can attract lots of water, kind of, draw it into our gut, um, particularly our small intestine. So, you know, we food as we, as we eat food, <laughs> goes through our mouth, down our esophagus, into our stomach, um, where it can sit there for a while. And then sort of the next step is it will be emptied into our small intestine. Um, and that's really where FODMAPs start having those um, actions. So we can get that water being pulled in to our small intestine, which can sort of increase the volume um, of the intestine and cause it to sort of stretch, if you like. Um, we'll come back to that stretch because that's an important thing when it comes to FODMAPs and IBS. Uh, so that's the first way in which FODMAPs sort of affect our gut is pulling that water into our small intestine. So next, the FODMAPs will enter our large intestine. Um, and when they get here, our large intestine is home to millions and millions and millions of bacteria, um, well, mostly bacteria, uh, that make up our gut microbiome. And they're super important for our health. They do all sorts of wonderful things for us. Um, but one thing that they also do is they can use FODMAPs as a source of food. So basically they can eat up those FODMAPs um, and digest them, which our body actually, for some FODMAP types, can't digest and break down. So it's only these bacteria that um, can actually chop them up and eat them and um, do something with them. And as a consequence of that process, we get a few things being produced. Um, and one of them is gas, <laughs> unfortunately. So gas bubbles coming or, uh, coming along. And again, we're getting that effect in our large intestine now of gas expanding the intestine mm. and stretching it. Um, and the real key thing with that stretch is for most people, it's not a problem. We get a bit of expansion, a bit of stretch in the gut. It's very normal and natural um, to happen, um, and it doesn't cause them any problem. However, with uh, IBS, uh, there's all of these nerves that wrap around our intestine, um, and in someone with IBS, they seem to be highly sensitive. So when we're getting this stretching happening from extra water being pulled into the intestine and extra gas being produced, um, it's not really extra. It's just an, can be a normal amount <laughs> as well. That's a good uh, thing. Our bodies just respond differently to it, right? They do, so, yes. Yeah. They respond differently is what I'm trying to get at. Um, so there's something going on with those nerves that are, that are wrapped around our intestine um, that makes them more sensitive than someone without IBS. So that stretching is then signaling um, to our brain to be sensed and experienced as pain, um, which is unusual um, for most people. But yeah, with someone with IBS, that's a, a common occurrence that happens to them often daily. Mm. So from what I'm hearing, like as we eat, 
these fob maps, we're getting the extra water being drawn into our gut. We're getting that gas fermentation as our gut bacteria break down and consume those fob maps for fuel for themselves. And yeah. then this is leading to, you know, the excess gas. And then from there, I'm guessing all of that can then trigger altered bowel movements, whether that's constipation for some people or diarrhea for others. Is that right? Correct. Yeah. So it's a lot to do with, again, those those nerves surrounding um, surrounding our gut performing in different ways when you have IBS compared to when you don't. So um, that could be triggering pain or discomfort sensations. It could also affect the motility of your bowel. So how quickly or slowly things um, travel through the gut, which is different for, for different people with IBS. Some experience that speed up. Um, some experiences slow down, so we get the diarrhea or the constipation as a consequence. Um, yeah, that's a in a nutshell. <laughs> <laughs> awesome, thank you for explaining that. So, I guess the next question is: when we eat a high FODMAP food and we're sensitive to it, so the, what is the time range when we would expect to start seeing those FODMAP based symptoms? Yeah, good question. Um, and for everyone, this is going to be a little bit different. So as I mentioned, the the real effects of FODMAPs are kind of happening in our intestines. So um, the majority of the effects are going to be happening in that last part of our intestine or the large intestine. Um, and it actually takes quite a lot of time for food to travel um, all the way from our mouth to that large intestine. So we're not talking minutes here. We're more talking a much more extended period of time. So it could be more yes. like hours, right? Yes, so, absolutely. Yeah. <laughs> so for, the, for the majority of people, um, it's going to be many, many hours. Um, we're typically looking at around at least six hours before you would start to expect to see um, those FODMAP-related symptoms occurring after you've consumed the high FODMAP food. And are there any situations where that FODMAP reaction might happen a little quicker? It is possible. Um, and these might be scenarios where you've got completely empty stomach and you're um, consuming something super concentrated with FODMAPs in a really easy to digest form. So, so we're talking like, like a smoothie with lots of high format fruit and milk like yes. that might make it through a little faster. Yes. So yeah, your liquids that are going to empty from your stomach quicker than kind of solid food that needs to sit there and digest and churn and be broken down a bit more. Um, those liquid foods are going to pass through into your intestine quicker. So it would make sense if you've got an empty stomach, particularly to start with, that um, you might experience a reaction a little bit sooner. That makes sense. So what I'm hearing from what you've just explained and the digestion process and how vomit triggers symptoms is that if you are eating a meal or if it's only a few minutes after a meal and you start experiencing symptoms, it's unlikely to be the FODMAPs that you've just had in that meal. So the next question people are going to want to know is, so what are triggering those symptoms then? Why, what's going on? Why am I feeling unwell? So there can be a couple of reasons for this, or probably more than a couple actually, <laughs> um, but to keep it fairly simple. Um, again, coming back to that nervous system or those nerves that surround our gut, that is really key in IBS. Um, and as we said before, it's oversensitized. It's, it's highly, highly sensitive to anything that's going on, which is part of normal digestion. So for some people, even just the act of eating and something being in their stomach can kind of trigger off those nerves and they experience some kind of symptom. Um, the other thing is that uh, there's a reflex when, when we eat food um, that is designed to help food move along our intestine. So to give it that 
push to make more space for us to eat more food at the next meal. Um, so when we eat, um, and this is particularly prevalent first thing in the morning, it's the strongest time where you'll notice this reflex happening. Um, we eat breakfast, for example, and we'll notice you have a cup you know, of coffee and things. Yes, <laughs> yes, have a cup of coffee, and then you need to go to the toilet and do a poo. Um, it's a very common thing, and most people associate that needing to do a poo in the morning with the coffee, um, but it's probably not actually the coffee. It's probably just the act of eating anything or drinking anything in the morning. Um, you get that really strong reflex happening with the nerves in your gut to sort of signal your body to push everything along, um, evacuate some space and make some room for that meal that you've just eaten. And that's why you, you need to go and have a bowel movement to make some more space for everything you're going to eat that day. So that reflex can be involved as well. And for some people with IBS, it seems that that reflex is almost overactive. So they do get that kind of, um, I guess, sensation that they need to go and empty their bowels more frequently than someone without IBS. So there's a few kind of key physiological things, isn't it? <laughs> but it is complicated and it is different for every person. Okay, so... If you're reacting quickly to a meal, obviously you now need to figure out how you're going to manage your symptoms, especially if they are impacting your quality of life. Like it's one thing to just have breakfast in the morning and be like, okay, I now just need to go to a loo and it's another thing to have urgency or pain or any of those extreme symptoms mm -hmm. or embarrassing symptoms um, yes. that come with irritable bowel syndrome. So I guess the next question is, what strategies can you use if you're experiencing those symptoms as you're eating or straight after eating meals? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question. Um, there's some pretty simple things that you can try and implement to manage these, these symptoms. Um, and these will be things like eating smaller meals a bit more frequently throughout the day. So just keeping that overall volume of your meal a bit smaller is potentially going to signal your gut a little bit less <laughs> to kind of um, move things along because you're not putting as much in your stomach. So you're not getting that stretch, as much of that stretch happening immediately. Um, so small and more frequent meals can be really helpful for some people. Um, another strategy there is in some ways to sort of understand what's normal as well so understand what's normal um, and knowing that 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 reflex that happens in your gut is very strong in the morning and it is quite um, acceptable for you to need to go to the bathroom with almost some urgency in the morning it's most people have that real urge um, to go so just getting your head around what's what's part of normal gut physiology what is um different for me and what is actually impacting on my quality of life um understanding those things can really help you to i guess prioritize what sort of strategies you need to put in place to manage that and there's also some research that's come out around uh things like mindful eating you know yes. taking time to calm down we've been talking a yes. lot about that communication between your brain and your gut so there's Mm. Um, is it the gut-based hypnotherapy, which is starting to have some science behind it and be quite beneficial? Are those sort of strategies you'd use as well? Yeah, absolutely. So if you, you do notice that you're one of those people that anything that you eat seems to trigger symptoms for you, um, definitely going, going down the line of one of those therapies that's going to target that gut brain connection um, and just hopefully kind of work on almost desensitizing you a little bit more and improve that communication that's happening between your gut and your and the nerves in um, nerves in your gut and nerves in your brain as well so that's incredibly helpful and there is some good research to to support the effectiveness of that approach um, so that's another one and there's just one more tip I guess you alluded to just there Alana is just being a bit slower with when you're eating so really trying to take the time to um, sit and have your meals and eat mindfully eat slowly 
chew your your food food really well. Yeah, chew your food really well, taste your food really well. Um, That's also just going to really kind of bring you back to that presence with your body um, and hopefully um, improve that mind, mind gut communication going on as well. Definitely. And um, hey, look, if you're sitting here and you're still convinced that it's some form of FODMAPs triggering your symptoms, then, you know, if you've had something the day before in a previous meal, then it could be a FODMAP Mm. that's triggering those symptoms. But that's definitely something that is worth going and discussing with a dietitian who can review a food and symptom diary with you and sort of do a bit of detective work around that. And there are a few other um, sort of food sensitivities out there, which we definitely not touching on today because we don't have the time um that can that can trigger all sorts of symptoms as well so Lindell, thank you so much for your time is there anything else you'd like to add to the session before we wrap it up no I think what you just mentioned there Alana is probably a key piece of information as well that I didn't really touch on earlier um is around FODMAPs or high FODMAP foods that you've eaten perhaps the day before Um, that can actually still be sitting in your intestine. So they might be still sitting in um, the sort of lower part of your small intestine. And then when you eat a meal the next day, um, for example, first thing in the morning, you get that really strong reflex that then pushes that food into your large intestine and we start getting that bacteria fermenting the FODMAPs and producing gas. Um, which triggers symptoms. So that process can be happening as well. And like you said, a bit of detective work sometimes is in order, but don't forget about the foods you've eaten the following day. Um, sorry, not the following day. The previous day, the day before. The previous day, that one. Don't forget about the foods you've eaten the previous day because they could also be key to figuring out and putting those puzzle pieces together to work out my, what might be triggering symptoms for you. Because it's quite common, isn't it, to have um, often up to three days worth of food like working its way through your digestive system at any one time. So there's, you know, it's not just a isolated meal by meal scenario. It's like you've got multiple food loads slowly working their way through your digestive system. That's right. And if you think about um, how frequently you have a bowel movement, that's kind of going to give you an idea of how many days worth of food you might have sitting in your intestine at any one period of time. So if you are a kind of person that has a bowel movement every second day or even every third, and that's normal for you, um, you can expect up to sort of that three days worth of food floating around in there somewhere being digested. So it can make it more, (laughs) sometimes more tricky to work out what's what's what but definitely working with a dietitian there um, who can act as a bit more of a detective and have that really detailed look at your diet using a food and symptom diary um, can often help get to the bottom of it very very sound advice there thank you so much for your time today Lindell, and taking us through the digestive system and how fob maps can trigger symptoms and what else might be going on we we really hope you've taken away some good nuggets of information and that this has given you a bit more confidence in your body and what is going on as well. So Lindell, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me. And to everyone listening in, if you'd like to go and support the amazing work that Monash University does, then please go and download the Monash University FODMAP Diet app. This app does cost money to download, but the money goes straight back into FODMAP research. So you're not only helping yourself, but your community when you download it. There's also lots of additional resources on monashfodmap.com or on a alittlebityummy.com. Thanks again for joining us, Lyndall, and to everyone else listening in, we look forward to seeing you at our next FODMAT chat session. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.